Okay. Then we start with the final <coughs> final session. Um, we talked a bit about the mechanisms, the, or the theoretical uh, mechanisms behind this these trends, and uh, it's uh, it's easy to see the r the the rationality of this. And it's also easy to see that there is a lot of things that can affect this in a, in a, in a negative way through, for instance, bottlenecks. And, so <coughs> and the cost function, which is nicely uh, increasing like this, um, you can also in that cost function in include um, risk <coughs> by adding the expected uh, costs of uh, of um, or <coughs> you can add the risk costs, the costs of risk into this uh, into this cost function as well to in to include that into the into the picture. And I have just used <coughs> used letters here, but these functions are uh, are it's fully possible to to uh, to calculate or estimate them. To, to be able to find the, the, the points where uh, you can derive the production costs uh, depending on the demand and derive the production costs depending on what will happen in the system when it comes to in terms of, uh, of the bottleneck problem. <coughs> Another, when I talk about bottlenecks, the it can be, of course, absolute disruptions that nothing can pass, uh, but it can also be elements like congestion in an urban road network, which is an <coughs> which is an issue in in ma in many parts of the world. I mean, the Norwegian national budget, <coughs> state budget, was uh, was launched yesterday, and there was a lot of attention towards uh, transportation and road investments and rail investments and so on. Uh, but uh, I came from New York yes, the day before yesterday, and uh, congestion in Norway is nothing <laughs> as compared to to what you can see there and in, and in other countries. It's it's nothing at all. So uh, it's good to take a trip abroad uh, from time to time. So to to learn that. The scale of the problems are slightly different in, in other parts of, of the world. And I guess there are places that are much worse than, than New York as well. Okay. Uh, <coughs> location policy. And now I talk about location of, uh, of production facilities. Can depend on, on, on various factors like uh, importance of distribution costs transportation value, transportation cost ratio, delivery time, demand volatility, inventory costs, and manufacturing costs. And so I tried to illustrate some of it, some of this, these aspects there, where uh, <coughs> the manufacturing costs try to be illustrated here, and then you can introduce transport costs with possible uh, bottlenecks problems uh, as the resulting cost curve because you need to see the, them in, in uh, you need to see the total cost picture it's very important so this is uh, <coughs> how it how it looks like in uh, in a very graphical sense uh, this is again European uh, conditions where you can see a development from <coughs> more decentralized uh, structure with, with, with full product range for, for local or national markets. And then this picture <coughs> where you centralize, where you have, let's say, factories with a limited uh, scope in terms of uh, number of, of products but where you can distribute to a, to a larger market. 
And to do that, you, <coughs> you are of course dependent on on um, on a good transportation network. Um, so, in this case, you are sort of exploiting scale effects. To be able to exploit the scale effects, you need to to take care of the or to <coughs> have a perception of this possible bottle bottleneck problem. And <coughs> to be able to 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 harvest the benefits of centralized production, a good network is uh, transport network is is vital, and that is why the EU, as well as many other countries, focuses on transport infrastructure investment packages, deregulation of or um, not deregulation, but you know, deregulation as well, but. To to uh, <coughs> enhance competition in the transport industry, and also to get rid of uh, customs and trade barriers, because they are also part of this cost picture. So the rationale behind getting rid of uh, border crossing uh, issues, which takes time and needs a lot of documentation, uh, can be the rationale can be actually derived from a very simple illustration like that. Because if you have costly cr border crossings and a bad transportation network, you are not likely to end up in this situation. You will then maintain a decentralized structure. The Norwegian <coughs> Chamber of Commerce, the, the Association for, for the Norwegian in Manufacturing Industry. They are claiming that, well, we should really have an improved transport network to Europe to be able to sell our products to the large European market, they say. Right? But I think <coughs> they perhaps tend to forget that if that argument <coughs> should be valid, they need to make sure that their production cost level is competitive at the outset. Because there is always a two-way road. I mean, the big European players can also <coughs> be tempted to enter into the rather lucrative, rich and prosperous Norwegian market. And if the Norwegian companies, they may be <coughs> kind of taken by surprise, uh, in a way. Because if they are not able to compete here on the production cost level, it's no use, or little use perhaps to reduce the transport costs of getting to the continent, because then the continent may try to compete with the Norwegian domestic industry, which, uh, and, the, and the equilibrium there, as you remember from the international trade lecture, is dependent upon cost differences and transport costs. So it's not <laughs> not necessary, uh, at least not from theory, evident that a better road network towards Europe will benefit the Norwegian industry without doing a deeper analysis. So it's uh, it's a it's a complicated picture. Actually, some countries may, may actually, at least in the short run, benefit from borders and not that well-functioning networks because their home industry is protected. But if they are able to compete <coughs> with smart solutions, good use of, ca of, uh, of capital-intensive production in a high-cost country like, uh, like the Norwegian, like, the, like Norway, 
better transportation is a is a is an important benefit for them. But if they're ineffective, it's not necessarily a benefit because others may then compete more fiercely with their uh, in in the in the, in their domestic market. This is just a, a simple figure to to show some trade-offs here. You have a trade-off here <laughs> between distribution costs, most important for the communication with the end customers, and inventory cost, most important um, for this product in question. Demand for shorter delivery time versus longer delivery time. That, that customers can live with longer delivery times. And you have the demand volatility here, lower, greater. So, <coughs> let's say a combination of um, high demand volatility, focus on inventory costs, and that you can live with a slightly longer delivery time may call for a continental level of centralization, which means that you can live with a centralized structure like this. The advantage <coughs> with greater demand volatility and a certain amount of centralization, could you imagine what that is? You have you have a lot of them. You have done a lot of markets, smaller markets. And they have one central unit <coughs> not not too far away. Right? So you have time. And you have demand. And to make it simple, then let's cope with two countries. And the demand is volatile, means that it fluctuates over time. Like this. And you can continue. Country one. And then if you set up a <coughs> an inventory facility for to cope with this demand, you will need to live with a varying capacity utilization in this system. But if you are <coughs> if you are doing your analysis and you look for for another country that may have You have this structure. You you may have a better capacity utilization in your inventory, and you may even be able to do with a lower level of inventory. Inventory, because of this counter cyclical demand pattern, this counter cyclical demand pattern that you have here. I mean, if you <coughs> if you look for a let's say a country with with a structure which is you should call something like this, you wouldn't like that because that will all uh, that will cost nothing but but even larger um, volatility in demand as seen from, the, from an in inventory holding perspective. But having markets that are in a <coughs> counter-cyclical situation is good, because then you can keep the inventory 
perhaps at the lower level and with more constant capacity utilization. <laughs> International <coughs> here means that the lead times are longer. If you have a low demand volatility, it's harder when you have a very a strongly centralized uh, structure to to be able to serve even such counter cyclical markets because the lead times will be too long. But if you can live with, <laughs> if you have a lower demand volatility and longer delivery time, and you can read that as, let's say, an engine producer for uh, for the car industry, they can well be located in only one place, producing engines for a variety of car brands. And uh, I mean, even if if you are located. Um, far away from the from the factory you can I mean the lead times are not in the, in, in a modern world that, uh, world that long but <coughs> the economies of scale in such a production like like car engines is it's it's they are actually huge because it costs a lot to develop engines and they are relatively cheap to produce so an international <coughs> consolidation of such production is uh, is actually taking place Not to just one, but to a very f limited numbers. You can mention Volkswagen, Volvo, Citroen, Peugeot, BMW as examples of car brands that uses the same engines from a common factory. So it's good to know that my old Citroen has the same engine as a brand new BMW. It's good to know. <laughs> and then if you are here with short delivery time and, and distribution cost most important, could be let's say uh, types of medical equipment. We have very short demand for a very short delivery time, it may be essential commodities and they may also be quite expensive to, to distribute and you will try to keep the inventories local. And here <coughs> you need also to take in bottlenecks into consideration. If you have transport bottlenecks discussed at the beginning of this uh, course, the, the, the landlockedness of a certain, a certain African countries, for instance, then it would, of course, to, to, to mitigate the, that problem, you would keep local inventories of essential goods, perhaps also not so essential goods to reduce costs. Distribution strategies. Um, <coughs> in an international perspective, there are basically three main ones from local transshipment points um, where you have uh, these descriptions with the pros and cons. Direct shipments. <coughs> um, with short lead times to customers, but with uh, duplication of, uh, of uh, stocks as, as a problem. From regional distribution centers, um, then we have this, uh, we can also have this, uh, this uh, characteristics of having let's say supplies stored at a location awaiting orders from an assembly plant for final configuration of uh, of the an of the products that is going to be shipped to the to the end users so regional distribution centers <coughs> they exploit 
some scope effects. Scale effects is doing the same thing, the same operation, the same type of production at different scales. Scope effects is the benefits of, let's say, using your production plant to produce varieties of a, of a, of a product. scope effects is if you, <coughs> you are not necessarily producing exactly the same product, but you can produce a variety of products um, which can use the same production equipment, but you produce a variety of products. Um, in terms of transportation then, uh, <coughs> the scale effects there is connected to, to size and maybe also to, to, uh, to frequency because you can increase departure frequency by using the same manning and the same equipment but you just produce more. The scope effect is that you can use that equipment to transport <coughs> various types of commodities. You can you can have <coughs> you can have a variety of uh, of uh, of goods on board, which kind of creates a kind of a scope effect. Um, the main con, the main pro is the is to to reduce the the, the level of inventory, consolidate shipments, and then again exploit these. Scale, scale effects, but the con is the longer lead time to customers, <coughs> which may be amended by better transportation systems, of course. And then you have the, <coughs> the direct shipments from, uh, from, from, uh, from factory um, or vendors, um, where you have a low overall inventory level because everything goes goes <laughs> directly, but you may have long lead time to customers, and I may add perhaps lower capacity or at least more unpredictable capacity utilization in the transport system. Because here you you consolidate. Also here you consolidate cargo try to use capacity more efficiently. It could, in this case, uh, result in long lead times to customers. I would say that, however, that this A could also have long lead times as a, as a, as a con, as a cost driver. It's not because local transit shipment point may actually act as a, as a distribution center in practice with the consolidation and, and everything. Yeah, this is, uh, I have talked about that one. Uh, so I think I'll just skip it. Uh, this is also dealt with, and it's uh, it's quite self-evident that uh, you have uh, issues with coordinating along an international pipeline that could cause concerns with respect to uncertainty, risk, distance, and so forth. Uh, <coughs> this can be done when you when you are going to plan this in in practice for a, let's say for a specific type of product and you're going to compare different different uh, ways of setting up this uh, this international uh, or if even to, uh, to assess if you're going to engage <coughs> in an international logistics uh, pipeline because this is just uh, shown um, 
the inventory difference as the length of the pipeline increases to be able to get the same amount of goods through this pipeline there is certain uh, this, these numbers are, <coughs> are chosen arbitrarily I think but it's just to, sh to show that there is a kind of a, a kind of a bullwhip effect involved here <coughs> we need to, to take care of a certain amount of uncertainty and uh, and a large number of stops so more goods as the pipeline extends more goods are held in an in inventory it's it's quite intuitively reasonable that it is it is <coughs> acting this way but on the other hand then <coughs> um, reduce production costs advantage is connected to uh, to uh, to centralization in terms of uh, establishing patterns like this is on the other hand acting as advantages of engaging into an international uh, logistics sort of pipeline you can take advantage of la low labor costs and things like that as we have talked about so this is just a part of the picture but, uh, but it's, uh, <coughs> it's an important part of the picture because it says something about the transportation and distribution and inventory keeping part of, of this uh, this cost picture yeah just to show that we talk about even if you can draw nice curves and cost functions and things like that we talk about physical matters here moving cargo from one place to another but uh, with different implications for uh, lead times and costs and risks and, and everything. Breakpoints <coughs> like uh, like this where you and this where you consolidate split shipments into smaller shipments, <coughs> combine them again into larger shipments to get them to to a specific destination is encumbered with, uh, with risks because most of the breakage damages takes place in the distribution centers because of all the handling operations delays and things <coughs> I, <laughs> I had a phone call with, with one of my, <coughs> my friends uh, yesterday evening he is engaged in uh, running a uh, a kind of a harbor for for uh, leisure boating leisure boats and they were expecting a tractor which was supposed to take the boats up from the sea and get them back into the sea again in uh, in springtime and they were waiting for a tractor from uh, somewhere far away the only thing he knew that I should have had that tractor three weeks ago I have got it I know that it is a container, it, it is in a container, in a port, in uh, Trondheim. The problem is that it is 900 containers and nobody knows what's in them. So they need to ship them out one by one or two by two, which is a normal amount on a, on a, on a, on a truck. And it might be, he might be lucky and get number five, but he might also get number 900, which is, uh, it would take some weeks. And I think he's on his way to pass number 250, as we speak now. So it may take some, some time to, to get this sorted. <laughs> so, <coughs> so there are lots of aspects, and one of them is actually, um, the ability to trace the goods and that has been a, a, a quite good development in that but I have not solved entirely the problem of tra tracing what's in a container in a proper way at least not in, in, in small-scale operations like, uh, like 
some of the Norwegian ones. It's much better for the larger container ports. Uh, <coughs> because, I mean, if you know that you are going to get container number 350 within five weeks, it's better to know that than just not knowing whether you get it tomorrow or next year, to, to be a bit blunt. So predictability is good. Even if you get delays, even if you get uh, <coughs> variability in, in, in lead times and so on, as long as you, you can plan for it by getting the information that you get your cargo next Friday is much better than saying, well, you might get it tomorrow or you might get it in three weeks. We don't know for sure. That has obvious consequences for, uh, for, uh, for production planning. Uh, <coughs> just, well, I think I, I want to show you some, uh, some cons configurations in a specific case throw between China and Norway. But I think I will just stop now and uh, because otherwise it will be very very fast and uh, and not and, and perhaps a bit too shallow. So I will stop now and take this next time to tr try to show you some configurations from shipping of consumer goods from China to Norway, which is actually based on a on a real life case. So um if there are no questions, I will I will stop. Uh, I apologize for um, not having posted the lecture notes for lecture four. I've done it now, so it should be in place. Um, I will also amend the noise problems, uh, the problems with the mic that was uh, that happened in 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 during lecture four, but I haven't had time to do it. So before, I think I'll do it tomorrow. Okay, thank you.